Thanks to all the audience who follows our podcast. We have the honor today of having Dr. Michel Berger. Dr. Berger is professor and chairman of the Department of Neurological Surgery at UCSF and director of the Brain Tumor Center, director of the Center for Neurological Injury and Repair, and co-director of the Adult Brain Tumor Surgery Program at University of California, San Francisco. Now, at the 2021 IWBNC, Dr. Berger is going to share his lecture titled, The Role of Brain Mapping for Glioma Resection, results with nearly 2,000 awake mapping cases. Please type write your questions in the Q&A panel. We will read them at the end of Dr. Berger, Berger's inter intervention. Welcome, Dr. Berger, and thank you. The microphone is all yours. You have the microphone off. Got Great. it. Perfect. Okay. Welcome to IWBNC. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have a lot to cover um, in this lecture. I really appreciate being able to give this lecture. I had the honor of being uh, in Colombia many years ago and um, I enjoyed it very much. It's a beautiful, beautiful country, beautiful people. And it was a great thrill for me. And I hope I can come back and share experiences again with all of my friends and colleagues in Colombia and in other places in South America, and hopefully we can do some cases together sometime. So I have uh, been involved with this brain mapping process for quite some time, and it goes back to, let's see if I can do this. It goes back to <clears throat> my, um, experience in two places that I've been in my career. One was when I was a resident, a young resident, I learned the role of extent of resection in the glioma field from my mentor, Charlie Wilson. And when I left UCSF to have my first faculty meeting, I was very interested in trying to maximize the extent of resection <clears throat> and minimize morbidity. And I one day went to the operating room and looked at Dr. Ogerman, who was an epilepsy surgeon, and something came together for me because it made me understand that function was clearly more important than anatomy. So I started in 1986, trying to understand what was available for functional mapping for tumor resection. And I realized that there wasn't much published. In fact, there were only two articles published before um, or at the time I started my career. And I also uh, had to begin a journey where I learned as much as I could about what we knew about the organization of language in the brain. And it largely came from my undergraduate experience when I was at Harvard College in Boston. I was able to audit the courses of uh, Dr. Geshwin, who was very famous in terms of his understanding of language systems. And it was, there were two things that he taught me or that I learned from his work. One was that there was connectivity in the brain between regions. In other words, we learned early on from his work in describing conduction aphasia that it was the disconnection sometimes indicating disruption of the subcortical system that resulted in these aphasic conditions. The second thing I learned from his work is that there was plasticity in the brain. And 
I didn't really understand what that meant at the time. And I'll show you in my career how I evolved the concept to prove to myself that the adult brain is capable of plasticity and reorganization, which is a very important um, understanding that we as surgeons need to have. We'll come back to this in a bit. <clears throat> in the history of our um, specialty in neurosurgery, the person who had the greatest impact on mapping was Wilder Penfield. And he demonstrated how we could use direct cortical stimulation mapping to identify areas that either evoked function, meaning made something move or feel, or interrupted function like language. And so these were early studies that I read and understood and learned a great deal from. And so as I began my career in being a glioma surgeon primarily, um, I realized as time went on very quickly that extent of resection was critically important in the outcome of patients with gliomas. So now we were, now I was at a phase, at least in my career, where I knew I had to do an aggressive resection, but of course, safety is very, very important. And had to be very concerned about the end result of what we were doing. So at this point in time in 1986, my, my whole goal was maximize extent of resection, minimize morbidity, use brain mapping to do so. And now I'm gonna show you the result of that nearly 40 years later as I went through my career. Now, when I was, president of the AANS and gave my presidential address, I made, I made the whole theme of the meeting around safety. And again, what's important to take away from this lecture is that the reason why we do the mapping is we want to enhance extent of resection, but Unlike intraoperative MRI, where you can use that to enhance extent of resection, it has nothing to do with safety. But mapping promoted safety in the resection of doing an aggressive removal of the tumor. So patient safety was critically important. And as I mentioned previously, I learned early in my career, and I think it's very important for all of the young neurosurgeons listening in, you can think about all the different tools we have to expedite extent of resection, but no matter what you do, no matter what tool you use, you have to remember that function at the end of the day is more important than determining extent of resection than anatomy. And the best analogy I can give you is flying a plane at night. If you want to be safe when you fly a plane at night, you must use radar because you can't see where you're going. And the functional mapping shows you where you're going. It's your radar during the course of surgery. And it's not about the anatomy. It's not, a, it's not about looking out the plane and seeing where you're gonna go. It's relying on your radar or your functional mapping. So. There are many different ways to do the brain mapping and I'm gonna concentrate mostly on awake surgery. This was a very important article that I wrote early in my career and now just uh, four years after I started in 1989, where we showed that probably the most important part of this whole thing was the fact that there were no two patients who were alike in terms of where their language systems were located. Very different than the motor system, which is hardwired, very different than the sensory system or the visual system. But language pathways are variable, very, very different. And it was important to understand this early on because it meant that we were going to have to map each and every patient 
The other thing I learned early on was that functional MRI scans did not allow me to predict whether or not I was going to find function during a resection. Uh, oftentimes, early on in my career, I would be hesitant to operate on a patient if the functional MRI was active in an area. But gradually, I began to challenge that and realize that functional MRI can never, ever tell you whether a patient is operable or inoperable. So we learned about variability in language localization amongst people we operated on. We also learned that if we didn't find a positive site, uh, we could rely on that information to do the resection. Now, here's where the schools of brain mapping have become separate. Um, many of us in the brain mapping field still believe that negative mapping is perfectly fine. Early on in my career, I did not believe that negative mapping would allow me to do a safe resection. But now I realize that negative mapping, if I get a map and it's clearly not functional, that I can do the resection because I've, I'll show you the morbidity profile favors the fact that negative mapping can be relied upon to do a resection. Now here's the issue with variability. And the variability here is that, and I'm not sure if you're seeing this uh, or not, but okay, I can't seem to move this up at all, but that's fine. So, as far as variability is concerned, what we showed was that there is variability in the localization of sites. So for example, speech arrest, we see the likelihood of finding speech arrest in this area, but we can also see it in other locations, including the superior temporal gyrus. Likewise, anomia is seen typically in the superior portion of the temporal gyrus in the back area, but on the other hand, we see sometimes anomia in other regions well beyond the site. So this just shows you in red, the probability of finding a function like naming or reading or speaking, but there's a great deal of variability over the population. This was based upon every patient I ever operated on where we collected the data from using navigation, and then we brought it in and did these probability maps to confirm that. <clears throat> so this was the, oh, let me go back. So this was the, the most important, I think, study that I did um, early in my career where I showed that if I relied on negative mapping, so in other words, if I did a small exposure and I mapped that area for naming, for reading, comprehension, and I did not find any function in that area, I felt very comfortable removing the tumor without having a positive control. So this is the difference now, principally between me and some other folks like Hugh Defoe, who also work in this field, very significantly, but believe that they need a wider exposure to get a positive map. And the answer to what is right and what is wrong is that there is no right or there is no wrong. Meaning if you want to do a big exposure and get a positive site, that's fine. You can do just the same degree of resection as safely as possible if you do a smaller exposure and get negative data. That's an important message that I want you to understand as a result of this lecture. And I know that this is the case because when I went back and looked at these patients several months after surgery, the likelihood of having a permanent deficit with negative mapping was very, very low, somewhere between one and 2%. And that's the way it's been all throughout my career. Mm -hmm. 
Some of you may be wondering, well, what happens if you have a left-handed patient and their language is seen on the right side of the brain? That's okay because the language systems, the way they're wired both cortically and subcortically are the same on the right side in a left-handed person as they are on the left side in a right-handed person. So there is no difference. The other thing I want you to understand as you're doing these procedures is that when you do these procedures, there is unquestionably going to be a very difficult early post-operative course. And if you look at all of these language tests that you do compared to pre-operative, two to three days post-operatively, things deteriorate. That's classic. Everybody's gonna have trouble with fluency, repetition, naming. That's just normal from swelling. But if you look at the results one month and I showed you the results of three months, virtually everybody's back to normal. The point I wanna make here is that you must not be concerned early on if a patient does not look very good or is not having good language, because if you did the mapping and you preserve the function, they're going to get better. You just have to wait it out as long as your mapping was done accurately. Now, what benefit does stimulation mapping play in achieving in a, a, a resection? There's no question if you look at the benefit of mapping in every procedure or every paper that's been written on mapping extended resection, you see that you can reduce the morbidity, the deficits by 50% if you use mapping versus if you don't. So today, if you see a patient with a brain tumor, a glioma, and it's anywhere near any potential pathway that can involve language, motor, vision, sensory function, you must use stimulation mapping to reduce your risk of a post-operative deficit. That's another very important message that we've learned. And it's part of now what we call the standard of care, certainly in North America, and I believe now in South America as well. Well, um, I really have spent a great deal of my career understanding how to do awake surgery. In the very beginning, it was very, uh, complicated, it was somewhat frightening, it was uh, difficult to do this. But over time, um, I became much more confident in the data. And thus far in my career, I've done nearly 2000 cases, both in Seattle and in San Francisco. And what I wanna do is just show you some of the, the results of those cases. Um, there are a number of things to consider, and I, I don't have time to go through all of these things, and I've written about them, and if, if any of you want more details, just let me know, and I'll tell you where you can find these publications. But the, the important message is that we can do this pretty much on any patient. We use a very standard regimen of drugs, like short-acting narcotics, sedatives like propofol or dexamethotomidine. We don't use general anesthesia or laryngeal masks. We can make the pain go away with local anesthetics in the skin and the dura. We do very focused exposures <clears throat> because we do our removals based upon negative mapping. And we can basically test any function we want to test both cortically and subcortically, and I'll show you examples of this. This is the strategy and basically it remains in a sleep awake, a sleep awake procedure. Sleep awake at the end depends on whether we're doing subcortical mapping. <clears throat> so if we do subcortical mapping, we keep the patient awake for that entire procedure and then we put them to sleep for the closure. The anesthetic regimen is something that I, as the surgeon, decide, not the anesthesiologist. So I will give the patient standard dose 
through the anesthesiologist of propofol. Or I like to use propofol because it's short acting uh, and remifentanil, short acting narcotic. But before I do a skin incision, I'll watch the patient and see how they do. And then sometimes up to 40% of the time, before I do a skin incision, I don't like the way the patient's behaving. They're restless, they're moving. So I stop the propofol, I add dexamethotomidine. I stop the dexamethotomidine, I just use remifentanil. And in very unusual circumstances, I don't use anything except lidocaine for the skin if they're not tolerating it. So you just have to decide yourself what works for you as the surgeon, because you don't want patients moving around, moving around or being uncomfortable during the process. In this study, I again show my late deficit rate to be about 2%. It's never going to be less than that in my hands. So if you can achieve a 2% deficit rate, you're doing as good as I could ever do. And that's perfectly right. That's perfectly fine. Now, when you look in the literature, you're going to see, um, you know, all sorts of different numbers, but I think the number you have to shoot for is 2%. If you have a deficit, why do you have it? Is it because there's swelling? Is it because you cut subcortical pathway or damage the cortical pathway, what's the reason? Well, we can figure that out now by doing post-operative diffusion weighted imaging to rule out ischemia. And we can do diffusion tensor imaging like we did in this study to look for white matter disruption. And now we can see very nicely when we remove a tumor like this, sometimes even with the subcortical mapping, there's inconsistent results. We might take part of the pathway with us. And when we take small portions of the pathway, we don't see post-operative deficits. However, if we take larger pieces of the path, depending on which pathway we're stimulating, it explains why we see post-operative deficits. So here's the message. The message is you need a good test for subcortical pathways to determine whether or not you can continue with the reception. I'll show you what I mean. And this is a good example. This is a study that's currently under review at the Journal of Neurosurgery. It's about one area, the middle frontal gyrus. And what we show in this study is Typically that once we do the mapping of the cortex, the most important area is the subcortical mapping here, because if we do a resection and we don't pay attention to this pathway, we're going to transect that pathway, we're gonna cut it. But if we have a test that describes how to know whether we're stimulating the subcortical pathway, such as, the inferior frontal occipital gyrus, for example, or the arcuate fasciculus, then we're able to identify the pathway using our radar, our subcortical mapping, and then we preserve it. And when we had deficits afterwards, and we were able to identify the reasons, the reason why we were successful in not causing injury to this area because of the subcortical system is we were able to activate subcortical language pathways and not cause deficits. So again, we did this resection, we found the pathway, we stopped at that point. We had problems afterwards, but at three months, we didn't see any deficits. This is a perfectly good example of why you must do subcortical mapping along with cortical mapping, and it differs as to what you want to do. If you want to learn some more about just the whole awake craniotomy field, uh, this is a paper we published last year with other colleagues 
in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology. It's a, it's a very good meta-analysis of what's available in the field. I'll refer you to that. Um, we published another study recently in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology, and this looks at a review of our experience only, looking at the modalities that we use, the very simple, straightforward tests that we do for the cortical and the subcortical system. It also gives a nice comparison amongst other groups around the world who do mapping awake, what their deficit rates are, and where you should be if, for example, you follow our paradigm for mapping. It's gonna be 2% in this case. I think we, we just rounded it up to 3% and it's 2.3%, but it just shows you what the range is for those groups that report it and where you should try to go with these techniques if you do this correctly. <clears throat> this is the setup we use in the operating room. It's not unusual in the sense that we have our mapping team doing the ECOG back here. We have our anesthesia people here, the surgeons are here. We do the testing over here and our microscopes and stimulators come in here with the nurses over here. Pretty standard setup. I use fairly simple tests as I showed you. I'm just gonna go back for a moment. These are the tests that I use for the functions that I'm interested in testing. This is going to be, I'll show you in comparison to some of the other people who do brain mapping, how different it gets. The subcortical system is very different. You have to map it differently. If you're looking for pathways in the subcortical system, and you can basically break it down to two different areas. The areas in the ventral language pathway and the areas in the dorsal language pathway. And the tests that we use were published recently in Brain and Language. And I'll just show you an example. Of if you want to stimulate the ventral stream, what do I mean by that? I mean the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, for example. If you want to stimulate that stream, how do you do it? You can show a patient a picture like this and like this at the same time. You can say to them, okay, I want you to tell me to read the word that is related to the picture. So they see this, you stimulate the subcortical system and they recognize that a rabbit and a horse are the same animal, meaning it's an animal, whereas a horse and a piece of fruit are different. So if they, if you say, tell me what the related word is and they read rabbit while you're stimulating in the white matter, you know that that pathway does not come into play and you can keep going with the resection. On the dorsal side, what do I mean by that? The arcuate fasciculus, the superior longitudinal fasciculus and its three divisions. You can show the patient a scene. The boy is dancing with the girl. The girl is writing subject and a verb, if you're stimulating and they produce a phonological paraphasia, then the stimulation induced phonological paraphasia means, and that's different than a semantic paraphasia because it's a sound difference in terms of how they describe this. Then you know you're in the dorsal stream and you must stop at that point. So now I've shown you the test for cortical function, for reading, for naming, for comprehension, for motor function. I've shown you the tests in the subcortical system looking for the ventral stream, the dorsal stream. That's all I do. I don't do anything more than that. Sometimes if I'm in the parietal lobe on the right side, I may want to look for the ability to predict a post-operative, a praxis, 
So I'll do a line bisection test where I'll have a line. And while I'm stimulating, I tell the patient to put an X in the middle of the line. And if they put it in the middle of the line, while I'm stimulating, then I know I'm not going to cause a parietal lobe dysfunction in the subcortical system. So how do I do these resections? I stimulate in my left hand, I use the cavitron in my right hand. So my foot pedal for the cavitron's in my right hand, my right foot, and then I've got the cavitron and then I'm stimulating while I'm doing both. I learned to operate with both instruments and when I'm not stimulating, I have the bipolar in my left hand with the foot pedal on my left foot, the cavitron in my right hand with the foot pedal in my right foot. You don't ever mix those up because of the obvious problem you can get into. Now, I show this to you because Hugh Defoe was one of my fellows when I was at the University of Washington, he came and worked with me and George Ojeda to learn these techniques. He has taken brain mapping to a completely different level, uh, a phenomenal level where he looks at the many, many different functions of the cortical and subcortical white matter. Tests that I don't do, looking at all of these things, he's come up with very nice charts where if you want to test the cortical site, what would you expect to find, for example, in the supermarginal gyrus? What would you find in the right hemisphere, spatial perception, et cetera? So this is a very nice detailed map of cortical function. This is a very nice detailed map in the left and the right hemisphere of subcortical function. So you see right away the two different schools of mapping. My school of mapping, negative mapping, focused exposures, simple tests or tests that define exactly what I'm looking for versus more extensive mapping, looking at many different functions, using wider exposures. Either way is fine. It's up to you what you wanna do. We'll come back to this if there are questions about this. If you wanna learn more about both the cortical and the subcortical organization of language, I recommend you read this article that we wrote together with uh, my colleague, Eddie Chang, who is now the chair of neurosurgery at UCSF. He took over from me and is continuing on as I am with brain mapping, looking at different cognitive functions. Um, this is a study we did very recently, looking at a different way to predict the role of connectivity. So this is an article where we use MEG or magnetic source imaging, where we look at MRI scan superimposed on neuronal activation based upon MEG mapping. And based on a number of tests preoperatively, because some of you may be wondering, well, what do I do preoperatively? Do I do anything? I don't do functional MRI because I don't rely on that at all. I do do connectivity maps where I look for areas that have high connectivity in these color-coded regions versus low connectivity. And going back and looking at post-operative deficits based upon post-operative connectivity, just like I used post-operative DTI to determine injury to the subcortical system, I can see very nicely that if I leave these highly connected sites alone. So in other words, if I know where a highly connected site is based upon the color map, and I leave that alone during surgery because I map it and I find that I can do subcortical stimulation and find an interruption in function, then 
that allows me to predict how a patient's going to do. So you may not have this technology, but for me, looking at connectivity of different regions helps me to prioritize what I map during surgery. If you don't have this technique, don't worry about it because the gold standard is subcortical language mapping. Mm. Now I talked about plasticity and I wanna just talk to you a little bit about plasticity because I think it's very important. I realized in my career as time went on that there were areas of the brain I would go back and I would map. And I did not find the function that I found initially. And we started looking at this preoperatively and we end postoperatively in both. And we tried to use the technique of transcortical stimulation. So in other words, there's another technology that you can use where you can stimulate through the scalp with electrical impulses and get a response, a motor response. And that can predict, if you superimpose it on an MRI scan, the likelihood of finding function in a given area. Well, it can also predict whether or not function is moving away from a tumor. So if you do an operation, you leave a piece of tumor that's functional, is reorganization happening? Well, we are showing with this transcranial magnetic stimulation that we can find areas where function moves away. And we've also been doing this now with language plasticity, looking at the fact of functional movement. So if we see an area that's got language in it preoperatively, and then we find it intraoperatively and we leave it alone, can we predict if it moves and we can go back and reoperate several years later? And we're using MEG activation to see if we can predict it. And here's what we've learned. Here's the basic message. We see plasticity in the gray matter in up to 40% of patients who we reoperate on. But in the white matter, we don't see plasticity. So there's something very, very different. The white matter is hardwired. So if you find a semantic paraphasia or a subcortical motor response, you cannot remove that. But in certain circumstances, if you find it in the cortex, and if you don't resect it, and then you follow these patients and the function moves away, then you can go back and remap when the tumor grows. And in 40% of the time, the function moves. So here's an example. This is a study we published several years ago where we showed in cases that I had mapped and found function. And then I remap in this patient 30 months later, re-stimulated and did not find function that there was plasticity in the adult cortex, not the white matter, cortex. So, and I saw this in 40% of the time. So let me just summarize where we are at this point in time. What I've told you is you can map cortical pathways and subcortical pathways. You can do focused exposures. You can do very limited types of testing in the awake setting to determine the resection. However, if you find a subcortical pathway that stimulates and is intact, you cannot under any circumstance violate that because there is no plasticity. If you find function in the cortex, you have two options. You can either push the resection until you get some deficits and then stop, or you can decide not to remove it. Wait several years and come back. If you don't have MEG, that's okay. You can still reoperate because based on the study I just showed you, 40% of the time function is going to move and you may be able to remove a tumor that you couldn't remove. Okay, 
Now, let's talk about the indications for awake craniotomy. Any of these kinds of lesions in any of these locations you can do. But I want to just touch on sleep conditions as well, because we still use sometimes a sleep motor mapping. And when do we use it and when do we not use it? Well, in my career, I have used subcortical motor mapping of sleep routinely. And as I evaluated recently, my experience with over 700 cases of subcortical motor mapping using bipolar, low frequency stimulation, I found that I still had a deficit rate. If I stimulated those pathways and I found them, I still had a permanent deficit rate of 4%. I didn't like that. I, I thought that was too high. So I started a new process that we published in the journal neurosurgery called triple motor mapping that we do asleep. And this is using bipolar low frequency stimulation, monopolar high frequency stimulation, and transcranial motor stimulation through the cortex during surgery or with a strip electric. In other words, motor evoked potentials. So using these three techniques, where with monopolar stimulation, you get one milliamp for one millimeter if you use high frequency stimulation. Whereas the bipolar stimulation is different, it's much more limited as well. So in other words, if I use monopolar stimulation and I see that I get a response at 15 milliamps, then I know I'm 15 millimeters away. So now I'll start resecting closer and then use bipolar stimulation when I get within 10 millimeters to go all the way down as low as I want to go with both bipolar and monopolar stimulation. And I can come within one or two millimeters of the motor tract or one or two millimeters of the language tract. But triple motor mapping is typically for the asleep patient. Now, I would say the world's expert on motor mapping done asleep is Lorenzo Bello. He was another uh, fellow of mine that uh, came to visit. We taught him these techniques many years ago, and he's done a beautiful job looking at motor mapping done asleep. And I suggest you take a look at this article. He recently published it. It's very, very useful if you're interested in this. And he reviews the literature on who uses this awake versus asleep and the reliability of awake versus asleep. So again, to summarize the motor mapping, I like to do it asleep. I like to use triple motor mapping um, with asleep conditions, I find it's very accurate. I don't feel strongly about doing awake motor mapping because it's too sensitive. I see too many responses that make me want to stop and I don't like to do that. So I like to use a sleep motor mapping. That's my preference. Okay. Now, where do we use awake mapping? We use it in the frontal lobe, for example. I'm just going to show you briefly and then show you some examples. We can use it in the temporal lobe, in the parietal lobe, in the insula. I'll show you some examples. Basically, it's a wonderful technique for cortical and subcortical mapping of language function. But what I found in my career along the way of doing these 2000 awake cases is that there's a lot of other things you can do with this technique. And I have about 10 or 15 minutes, I'm just gonna finish with some of these examples. And as I do this, I want you to think about it in your own experience. What would you do in a situation like this? Okay, so sometimes you're dealing with a subcortical glioma and you wanna know how to get into that lesion. My approach 
to anything subcortical is two things. I want to go at the tumor transcortically, but I want to go to the equator of the tumor by finding the distance, the shortest distance between the surface and the center of the tumor. So I call this the transcortical equatorial approach for glioma surgeons. And this is how I made my whole career based on this strategy. I'll show you what I mean by that. If you take a tumor in the mesial temporal lobe, if you were, um, let's say you were at, in Phoenix at the Barrow Neurologic Institute, if, if Robert Spetzer was going to do this operation, he would do an anterior approach, split the sylvian fissure and come down and resect this tumor. That's one way he might do it. And if it's a small tumor, that's perfectly fine. If you were Yasser Gil, Yasser Gil may come through the sylvian fissure, go down and go subinsular to get to the tumor. And that reduces the risk of cortical injury. Some people would come underneath the temporal lobe to get it. But for me, I would come through the temporal lobe by mapping this area first, finding a way in to the equator of the tumor such that I had the shortest distance from the surface to the center of the earth, to the center of the tumor. That's my approach to everything I do in the glioma realm. So this is what I mean. Here we are, you wanna go down to this area. I'm gonna go this way, but I'm gonna map this area first. I'm gonna make a very small cortical window. And then I'm gonna map as I go. And I'm gonna map, I'm gonna stimulate, I'm gonna map, I'm gonna stimulate. And I'm gonna continue to do this until I find function, whatever function I'm looking for, visual, language, motor, doesn't matter. I'm gonna keep going till I find function and then I'm gonna stop. And that to me is the way I do transcortical equatorial approaches to subcortical tumors. So look at this case. You look at this case, you ask yourself the question, how would you do this? There are many different answers for this, but for me, and I would say the following, if you look at a case like this and you spend more than five minutes trying to find the answer, then I don't think you ought to do the case. You need to look at a case and you need to have a plan based upon your experience of how you deal, this, deal with this. If you want to come interhemispheric to get the lesions like this in the thalamus, then you should do that. You shouldn't think about the different kinds of approaches. You should come up with your first, second, and third option and go with what you think is best. For me, my first option is transcortical. But if I'm going to do that, to get to the equator, I have to do this awake. You may not want to do this awake because the patient's in the lateral decubitus position. You're mapping language. You're then resecting silent cortex. You're then going in through the inferior parietal lobule. You're, re, you're mapping subcortical language. And then you're going all the way into the thalamus until you find the subcortical motor system. And then you come up with this resection. Now, I don't have a complete resection. My resection, if you look at the pre-contrast and the post-contrast, probably about 95, 97% but it was a safe resection. It was transcortical. The patient, after the first several weeks of a deficit, came back very nicely with his language because I had mapped this territory and I knew when to stop. This was the motor pathway, meaning the posterior limb of the internal capsule. But I didn't find any pathways for language mapping subcortically, so I felt very confident doing this technique. Okay, and then I'm gonna show you one more example and then we're gonna stop. 
And that's the insulin. And I think of all the things that I do, this is the most complicated area. It's the toughest area. It's, it took me the longest to learn my way around this area to feel comfortable doing it. And why is that? Why is that because of this? You have these blood vessels that if you hit one of them or cause them to go into spasm, you have all sorts of problems with ischemia. But what I didn't realize early in my career is that these little branches that come off the M2 or the M3 division of these articles, primarily the M2 division, these do not go to any of the deep subcortical pathways, including the motor system or the language system. So these little branches can be sacrificed to create what I call windows into the insula, but I don't do transylvian exposures very much because as I'll show you, most of the insular tumors that I see are very large and they do not allow you to go through the sylvian fissure to get up and down for that tumor. Again, pointing out these little branches don't go to these subcortical pathways and the lenticular striate vessels are typically pushed inside. And you can see them very nicely here. So I work transcortically to open the window, make a big sylvian fissure and work through these windows to do the tumor resection. And you can see, again, beautifully, the insular, the uh, lenticular striate vessels. And you always know, if you want, here's a very interesting pearl for you. If you're not sure the next time you're in the insula, you wanna know whether it's a tumor branch or whether it's a lenticular striate branch, all you need to do is put the microscope on the vessel, take your suction, very low suction, and just suck along the vessel. And if you break the arachnoid, all of these vessels have arachnoid. If you break the arachnoid and you see little drops of CSF coming out, that's a lenticular striate vessel. They are not tumor vessels. If you stroke that vessel and you don't see that, then they're tumor vessels. And as long as they're not on passage, you can take those tumor vessels. And that's how I do the insular surgery. If you wanna know more about it, um, I've used these classification systems of zone one, two, three, and four based upon the location of these tumors on preoperative imaging. And based upon these, the zone classification that I use, I call it the Berger Sinai classification, we have shown very nicely that the transcortical approach into these areas gives you more exposure with your instruments than the transylvian approach. So here's the strategy. You do the mapping, you find areas that are silent. You take off the cortex, below and above the sylvian fissure. You work through these M2 branches. You create these windows through them. And if you need to go far enough back behind functional tissue, you open the sylvian fissure to what you need to open to. And then you can map subcortically to define both the lenticular striates and the internal capsule, as well as the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. So this is how I do the insular tumors. And so for example, you can look at a tumor like this, and this is a good example where splitting the sylvian fissure is very good. It's not easy to do this. You know, I learned how to do this primarily from Mike Lawton, who used to be with me. He used to split the sylvian fissures and, you know, you can get in there, but it takes a good 45 minutes or so to do that. But at the end of the day, for a small lesion, it gives you a very nice exposure and you can get 
to the tumor, <clears throat> to the tumor where you want to go. And you can do the resection. And in this case, I did this with a patient awake because I wanted to make sure if I couldn't use this approach that I could remove this to get to this tumor, which was in zone three in Frasilvi. And so that's a good example. But the likelihood of finding this kind of tumor, in my experience, is less than 5% of the time. These are the tumors that I see, these big tumors that go in green all over the place. And splitting the fissure is not gonna get you here or there. And so in this case, what you need to do is, as I pointed out, you need to go transcortical, suprasylvian, infrasylvian, and then split the fissure underneath functional tissue to get to where you want to get to, to achieve a resection like this. This is my last slide. I'm just going to show you, um, if you're interested in learning more about the insular system, this is an article I wrote, which describes the experience in over 250 cases. I'm about to write probably my final paper on insular tumors with over 400 of these cases, again, showing a very, very low morbidity rate, including recurrent insular tumors using this strategy of transcortical mapping function going through the windows of the M2 branch and then doing subcortical mapping as you go. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, maybe we'll come back and uh, have some questions and things like that. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Berger. It was an amazing lecture. It was incredible, really. Thank you. I'm sure all the audience agree with me. Your experience in the treatment of gliomas and mapping is very robust. Thank you very much. Right now, we have some questions from the public. Um, one second. Okay. Uday Gupta uh, asks, is connectom neurosurgery can better tell us the connectivity, what is your opinion, sir? Uh, repeat the question, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. No, oh, sorry. Is connectom neurosurgery can better tell us the connectivity? What is your opinion, sir? Thank you. About doing connectivity? Yes, I think. Well, the connect, the connect home. The connect home, yeah. The connect so. home, please understand the connect home is an atlas based upon largely functional imaging, MEG, et cetera. In my experience, I think the connectivity maps have become very useful in telling me when I need to pay attention to an area that has connectivity in it that I may want to map to prove. The point being that I would never just rely on the connectivity map. I would always do my mapping intraoperatively, but I think it tells you when you have to be concerned about it. Okay, there's another question on, it's about children. Um, also, Ugai, Udai Gupta is asking, hey, Cranial to mean children is troublesome. Please give us uh, some suggestions for senior. Wait a about doing mapping in children? Or? Yes, about doing mapping in children and awake surgery in children. Yeah, well, um, essentially, I still operate on children awake if they are the age of 10 or 12 and older. The secret to doing awake surgery in children is to have their parents or the family member in the operating room with them. Now, I know it sounds a little strange, but it's been very, very helpful. The parents don't see anything. They come in the room after the child is awake. They hold their hand and they allow us to do the mapping we need to do. They don't feel anything during the resection 
and they're mildly, mildly sedated. So it works very, very well. In the child less than 10 or child that refuses to undergo mapping, then um, what I like to do is just simply um, put a grid in for cortical mapping, but it doesn't allow me to do subcortical mapping. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, Julian Andres Andraus is asking. Thank you, Dr. Berger, this, for this excellent lecture. Uh, when there is a cortical bleed due to a high grade glioma, some areas have certain ischemic penumbra due to the edema and loss of blood involved in, in the bleeding. Does this may represent a problem when using brain stimulation? or brain mapping, I, I, I mm -hmm. think, giving a false negative result? Yeah, well, um, if there's a hemorrhage in a tumor or near a tumor, obviously the function is gonna be affected. So what I like to do, if I can, wait. I like to wait a week or so on high dose steroids to see if the language will improve. If it doesn't improve, then I will do the patient asleep and I will only do uh, inside the tumor mapping, uh, not mapping, but resection with limited mapping to get them out of trouble. I will then, if it's a glioblastoma, treat them. And then I will come back after radiation in Temidar. If their language is better, I will go back and then reoperate them before they progress. Um, and so it just depends. If they get better in a week, if it's a high grade tumor, I will do the mapping. If they don't, I will treat them, come back later if they're better. And in a low grade tumor, we don't tend to see hemorrhages very much. So it's not a problem. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Madrignan is asking, thank you, Dr. Berger, for such a wonderful lecture. In a case where the resection does not involve, involve language areas, would you? not do an away craniotomy, but instead use cortical stimulation and motor potential and somatosensory potential. Do you think this is an option? Yeah, if I, if I operate on a right-handed patient and I'm not worried about language function, I have no problem doing that patient asleep for motor mapping. But if it's on the left, side, unless it's way up on top in the supplementary motor area or in the occipital lobe or in the frontal pole, anything else I will do awake because I don't want to interrupt the subcortical language system. There's another question. Uh, there, there's another question. Um, in cases where clinical neurological examination cannot be performed in the immediate postoperative period, period what do you recommend as an option for evaluation of these patients during critical post-op period? You mean, I, I'm not sure I understand it. So you mean if the uh, patient uh, doesn't it, have a deficit? No, I mean, if the patient, yeah, for example, um, after the surgery goes to ICU and under sedation and you cannot uh, evaluate patients in the immediate post-op period. Right, I know, but we don't, we don't keep the patient sedated, we wake them up. Yes. They're intubated. So we, we wake every patient up afterwards. We don't leave them intubated, we see what they're doing. But initially, uh, we don't do anything in the ICU for the first few hours. If the deficit you know, persists on their post-operative MRI scan, they get diffusion weighted imaging and they get DTI to make sure that I did not cause ischemic injury or cut the track. Okay, so is it any circumstance when had you have to keep the patient intubated after any like well, it's, it's, or, or any bleeding you had? To no, no, that would be unusual. I mean, unless there is a lot of swelling or something, mm -hmm. but okay. no.
Okay, there's another question. Um, Dr. Ramirez is asking, in addition to the considerations regarding the specific short acting medication as propofol in surgery in awake patients, do you administer additional prophylactic anticonvulsivants in these patients? And if so, which one and for how long time? Well, I like to use anticonvulsants, of course, for all the patients who are undergoing any kind of glioma surgery. Um, if they're not on it preoperatively, I usually start it during surgery using Keppra. Um, you have to be a little careful with Keppra and Dilantin because under propofol anesthesia, if you give the full dose immediately, they become sleepy from that dose. So what I like to do is at the start of the operation, I will start Keppra. I'll give 500 milligrams over three to four hours. And then while I'm closing, I'll give the second dose of 500 milligrams. Um, but I don't like to use Dilantin anymore because it causes too much sleep. Okay, and uh, I want to ask you, sir, uh, how do you treat the seizures when you have, have, the, have oh. them during, during, during surgeries? Oh when yeah, so we use... Yeah, cold, this is another question I, I, I asked. Yeah, you. well, we, we use cold ice mm -hmm. saline. Mm -hmm. So you must have on the table with the nurses the iced saline or ringer's solution that you get from the freezer. It's frozen, you break it up and you let it thaw and then you put that in a syringe and then you irrigate the cortex and it stops the seizures immediately. Yes. Thank you. Um, Anokon Kavara School is asking, in your experience, how often of postoperative mental complication in frontal love resection? Is mental mapping necessary? So, in frontal lobe resection? Yes, uh, I think yeah. uh, elevate to me. Like yeah, the, menta the mentalizing. I don't I don't do that particular test. Um, you know, I know that Hugh Defoe has written a lot about it. He's done this. He's the expert in this. I haven't, I mean, I haven't seen the problems that I think are related to interruption of those tracks. I used to think maybe the Aslan track had some role in that, but we've been transecting the Aslan track routinely and not seeing a problem with that. Um, I do map the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus looking for semantic paraphasia. And if I don't see a problem with that, to me, that's the only test I use. So I, you'd have to ask Dr. Defoe um, how he does the mentalizing mapping. I don't do it for frontal lobe. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. It's just that I haven't done it. I haven't seen it as a problem. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, um, we run out of time. So on behalf of CN, I would like to thank you again, Dr. Berger. Your lecture has been very illustrative and enlightening, really. We are really grateful for the, your participation in the 2021 IW PNC. Well, I appreciate it. Mucho gracias, and I hope we can meet in Colombia, preferably San Andres. <laughs> that, that's a really good idea. It's a very beautiful island. On the beach. <laughs> okay, we, thank we, you very much. We keep it up. Okay, thank you, sir. For all the audience, please keep in mind, this lecture will be available on our website for next week. In a few minutes, we will have, well, actually right now, or it's already started, Hughes Dufault is doing his lecture, Contribution of the Meta-Networking Theory of Brain Functions to Low-Grade Glioma Surgery, about over 1,100 awake procedures. To get the link 
for this conference, please follow the link, uh, which is available on the chat, or check the program schedule on our website, skinhoods.com. Thank you.